Hello, everyone, and welcome to Why Your Growing Degree Day Estimate Isn't Good Enough and How to Fix It. Today's presentation will be about 20 minutes, and we'll hear from Dr. Colin Campbell, who will discuss what you need to know for more accurate growing degree day models so you can be confident in your disease and pest management decisions. Colin Campbell has been a research scientist at METER for 19 years, following his PhD at Texas A&M University in Soil Physics, and is currently serving as Vice President of METER Environment. He is also adjunct faculty with the Department of Crop and Soil Sciences at Washington State University, where he co-teaches environmental biophysics, a class he took over from his father, Galen, nearly 20 years ago. Colin's early research focused on field scale measurements of CO2 and water vapor flux, but has shifted toward moisture and heat flow instrumentation for the soil plant atmosphere continuum. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Colin to get us started. Thanks, Brad. It's a pleasure to be with you today and talk about this subject, which I'm particularly interested in, and I'll tell you why. The picture on the left here is of my apple tree in my yard. And I really love this apple tree. It produces some of the sweetest and tastiest golden delicious apples that you'll ever find. And of course, one of my biggest concerns is having those apples affected by any pest damage. So on the right hand side, I'm showing a golden delicious apple and there's a little hole in that apple and that's caused, as I understand it, by a coddling moth that's particularly uh, interested in, in infesting in apples and pears. And so that's the little hole that the larva makes. And there's a pupa coming out of the apple that in the middle there that, that it's eaten. And it, once it's done that, it goes down and, and over and produces its cocoon on the trunk of the tree. Now, every year I'm really excited to eat the apples off my tree. And so I pay someone to come by and actually spray the tree to make sure that, that uh, pests like the coddling moth stay away. But it's interesting, uh, I can't remember a time where my entire apple tree was not completely infested, every single apple with coddling moth. They all had at least one hole in the apple. And I can't tell you how discouraging that is. I was so interested in eating these apples that I started picking a few and just eating off the side that didn't have the hole in it. But I don't really enjoy that so much. So why, when I'm paying a person to come by and spray the tree and kill specifically the coddling moth so I don't have holes in, why is my entire crop of apples being destroyed by the coddling moth? Well, it comes down to one very important thing. And I'm gonna talk about that in just a moment. First, I wanna talk about why we would use growing degree days or GDD. So here's the concept, and it's really simple. Plants and insects, insects being cold-blooded, develop on a clock that includes not only just time, but both time and temperature. This combination is called thermal time. And not a very uh, imaginative name, I suppose, but it really kind of points out that, it, that we are talking about time that, that adds together the temperature component. And it has the units of degree days, or some people, really get kind of adamant that they call them day degrees, but we're gonna use degree days in our discussion here. So the relationship between specific stages of development for these plants and these, these insects, um, this has been studied intensely for many species, many plants and many insects. And we know this pretty well, as it turns out. So knowing the degree days that it re is required for a specific organism to move through a specific stage is a powerful yet simple management tool where we can control things uh, by understanding when to, let's say, apply nitrogen to a plant or when to apply a pesticide to an insect to, to manage our system optimally. So before we launch into some of our discussion, we need to talk about what are some of the fundamentals of this thing called thermal time or growing degree days? So as I mentioned, all growth happens on, a, uh, on time and temperature clock, but it has to happen above this line here at the bottom, which we call T base or the, the bottom threshold temperature. Now, any time the temperature is above this baseline, that will allow the organism we're interested in to grow. And it grows more as, as, the, as the temperature 
is further above this line. And so there are a couple of ways that we can actually add together these temperatures. One is what we call an averaging method, and it just takes this maximum, or in some cases, the upper threshold, depending on what model we're using, and this base here, and the minimum, and it works out this kind of orangey pinkish area here. And that's basically the, the, the one day total of degree degrees, degree days that, that we can add to this insect or plant's development. There's another methodology that, that we can use. It's actually kind of here in blue and it's grayed out here. This is called the baskerville Edmund method. It just fits a sign function to your data, to your maximum and minimum, and then integrates under a curve. Now, these techniques were developed in a time where you typically didn't have as high quality temperature measurements as we do now. Now I actually make measurements maybe every 15 minutes out in the field, or we certainly can do way better than that. But you could also integrate under that one if you wanted to. And of course, that would give you more accuracy in your degree day. But the, the point I guess I'm trying to make is these two methods are out there. The BE method, the Baskerville Emmon, is a little bit better, a little bit more accurate, but their outputs are fairly similar. And I've done these calculations in several different data sets. Well, in any presentation, we have to have the obligatory equation. And I showed the this slide to a friend who wasn't familiar with this and he said, oh my gosh, and now I'm checking out of your presentation. Please don't check out. This slide, this equation simply says what I just told you about in that picture on the last slide, but if you're gonna do this mathematically, maybe you're interested in just seeing how this works. So this is thermal time, tau n. It's the daily summation, so I is just one day. So each day we sum the average temperature or T max plus T min divided by two, that's average temperature, and subtract from that the base temperature. And then we have that value and we multiply it by delta T, which is time. So this is one, one day. So we have the average temperature minus the base temperature times one. And then we, we just keep adding those up every day. Now, I actually put a little, little uh, spreadsheet on this slide to show you what it looked like day after day, but but it got a little complicated so i left that off but you can kind of see how this goes i'm happy to share with you some data so if you want to want to try this on your own i got a little spreadsheet you can work on just let me know so growing degree days are really simple to calculate as i mentioned maximum minimum temperature wherever we are where we're, we're interested in some of these daily warming units the tau n the the degree days um as i mentioned the difference between the the average and the base temperature and when you accumulate enough thermal time, the organism is going to advance one, from one stage to another. Now you might ask, okay, uh, why do we know this? Well, we know this because many, many researchers have gone and studied these things in the field, where, whatever they're interested in over time and done a significant number of studies. They're all out there in the literature and you can go find them. And while I was preparing for this talk, I thought, oh, I ought to go do this on my own. So I was interested in coddling moth, as you saw earlier, so that I could tell my spray person, hey, you come in right now and spray my moth so I get some apples to eat that I like. So I studied coddling moth a little, little carefully, as, as I mentioned, in apples and pears. Now, what you, so how do you know when to start adding up degree days? Well, that is what we call a biofix. That starts with a biofix. So you put in your tree, uh, a little trap has a pheromone in it for the moth of interest. And once you trap moths on these sticky traps, two successive nights, that is time zero. So that, that start starts this I equals one, that's day one. And so after that, we're just adding additional uh, degree days day after day. This lower threshold for the coddling moth is 10 degrees Celsius. Upper threshold is 29.4 degrees Celsius. Now, if you don't like Celsius, maybe you're a Fahrenheit person, that's just fine. Um, all of these do are done in both of them. So there are a couple of great resources to look at this. The University of California has a lot of great, great information on this in their agriculture uh, area. Just Google that. Or also Washington State University here where I live in the state of Washington. Um, also has that. So you can look at, you can get a whole bunch of these things, of course, not just for coddling moth, but that was my interest, how to eat good apples off my tree. So here, here's a stage 
so eggs, larvae, pupae, and adult. And here are the degree, degree days in units of degree C days for it to go through these various stages. So one thing that, that I didn't really think about a lot about my own apple tree is what the person who comes and sprays actually is using to kill these, these coddling moths because different sprays have different impacts. So if, if we're, so one spray might work on the larva stage and another may work on the pupae and something else may just be for the eggs. And so if you're not spraying at the time that it's hitting this particular stage, your efforts are meaningless. And quite frankly, that's exactly what's happening in my tree at my house, that I need to call up uh, my friend and just say, hey, listen, I, I can measure your growing degree days and I'll let you know when it's time to come to my house. I haven't done that yet, but I plan to. So this is not just for insects. This is for a lot of different things. So degree days are a management tool. And probably many of you have had experience in, in using these in various areas. For example, I really like this illustration I found on the internet. This is from a published article called Irrigated Wheat by Rawson and McPherson 2000. Um, and this just shows some of the, the growing degree days needed for different stages of wheat. And the reason I really like this is because when I was a, a young budding biologist as a sophomore in high school, I needed a, a project for biology. And I said, because my dad was environmental biophysicist, I always assumed that he should do most of the work in my science classes. Of course, he assumed the opposite. And he gave me a little project where I had a weather station out in this field full of wheat. And I used growing degree days to predict when the different leaf stages of the wheat were. So we've actually got some a little wheat plant growing. So first leaf, second leaf, third leaf, uh, fourth leaf here. I predicted when this fourth leaf would actually emerge based on growing degree days. And you know what? It worked really well. And as a sophomore in high school, I was completely shocked. I'm like, things operate on a clock? And they, they do. And I've never forgotten that experience. You can see a lot more degree days grow, go into to actually growing a wheat plant as it shows there. And we're not going to spend time going down deep into this. But if you need to make an operation, for example, I studied rice in my during my PhD. And it turned out that applying a nitrogen treatment right here in the rice. So was, rice has a, a similar set of stages, not exactly the same, but, but similar to what you see here. Applying nitrogen kind of before heading really did make a difference in the biomass accumulation of the rice, but they actually applied a nitrogen treatment out here after heading, and it turned out that it was a complete waste of money. Um, and, and we talked to, uh, talked to, to the grower about that, and, and that was all can pre be predicted and, and let you know when you're going to have to do that based on this nice nice little degree day calendar there. So th there are important management steps that need to be taken at specific phenological stage stages, no matter if we're talking about plants or insects. And our degree day modeling that we've talked about so far allows us to know when to act. But but timing is everything. As we talked about in that first example, if we just go out there and spray for coddling moth when we have time, you know, it's on the list and drive by my house and just spray when, when, when you know, the, 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 the list comes up, we don't know if we're gonna have that maximum effect that we need. And in fact, often we don't. So accurate data feeding into these models provides a stable platform from which to make decisions. So let's talk about some ways that we can gather this weather data, specifically temperature data and, that's actually occurring right now and whether or not that's gonna meet the needs to make this, to create the stable platform of action. So there are a few different sources of weather data for growing degree models. There's virtual data. We often talk about gridded data from models. So they take uh, uh, several weather stations that might be in a large area and they basically grid the earth in between and, and use statistics to try to figure out what the temperature is at a specific location. There are other ways to do this like regional weather. Uh, so something that, that's nearby the field, our field of interest, for example, or we can even put things in the field and we're gonna talk about it at the end, but the, all of those are not created equally. And we're gonna talk about the difference between a more accurate system like an aspirated, meaning flowing air over a sensor, 
or a, a corrected uh, version of that, or a non-aspirated, something that's just sitting passively in the sun, um, and what errors can come from that. So estimates of thermal time are only as good as the data they're fed. And so one of the things that I love recently was this publication by the Ag WeatherNet, and I can send you a link. Here's the link if you want to copy it down. You can also just search for this analysis and you'll find it out on, on the web. But so these are dark sky. This is one of those virtual weather sources. These are the, the growing degree days uh, from dark sky minus the actual observed degree days at the Ag Weather Station at Sakuma Station. Um, and this starts at January 1. So this is an accumulation over time. And this is the area error. So for a while, uh, not much error going on, but for these different years, you can see that, for example, the last year they did this in 2019, we just have massive uh, differences between the dark sky estimate and the observed growing degree days. Uh, other years were a little less. Uh, for example, there in 2013, there was no problem, but, but this graph clearly shows that sometimes we're way off the beaten path. So how well could we do with predicting this weather in, in natural systems out there? So um, as I mentioned, many are using this, the virtual weather to feed into these disease and pest models. Uh, this study was done, as I mentioned, by Ag WeatherNet by, by Dr. Dave Brown and, and a few colleagues. And what they show is significant error in their estimates. So let's take a specific case. So we have several station season combinations. So we have a few stations we're comparing this to, so not just that Sakuma station, but others. And then we go several seasons, so we're not just one year, but multiple years. And we combine these statistically and said, okay, with dark sky versus the actual sta station reading, if the actual degree days were, were 375 growing degree days, how would the dark sky estimate differ from the reality on the ground? So we can see that, so there would, zero would be no day difference. And we can see that, that many were fairly good at predicting um, or at zero, zero days. But as you see, as we, we get further from zero out toward 10 or negative 10, what we do see is that, that there are still predictions that go all the way out to 10 day error. So, so if, if you were adding up your, your degree days and you needed to, do an operation, if we use virtual weather, we might say at least one of these sites in one year, maybe that's over here, we would be 10 days off in our operation. And so their point was that 33% of the station season combinations showed more than five calendar day errors. So we'd be off by five days. And I don't know exactly, because I haven't been taking count, but I assume that's exactly what ha is happening at my house when, when we, we try to spray our apple tree. So the take home, virtual weather alone cannot replace an actual uh, infield weather station. So that's an, a direct quote from that article by Dr. Brown. So what about regional stations? There are a lot, of, there's a nice network of regional station around in agriculture areas. Here in Washington, it's Ag WeatherNet. And, and one of the efforts they've, they've been working on lately is actually to add more stations to that to get better data. But let's say we couldn't do that and we chose to just use our regional station instead of putting one directly out in our orchard or our field. Could one of these regional stations provide an accurate enough data for, for our field? Um, so here on the right, I'm gonna I'm comparing a regional station, infield station for an irrigated field. So here's air temperature and this is time and we're just talking about a month and a half worth of, of data here. It's just, I selected this because it's it's toward the summertime. We've got heavy growth going on. And I wanted to say, hey, what's the difference here? And so the darker color, this red and this black here, they represent this regional weather station. And the, the orange, the lighter color, the orange here and the light blue here, this was an infield station. And so we see when it's cooler, you know, do that badly. But when it starts to warm up, not surprisingly, we see a consistent overestimating bias um, by the, the, the regional weather station compared to the infield station. And that probably wouldn't su surprise us based on our knowledge of, of 
of evaporation, evapotranspiration in the field, and that that generally cooling things. So what does that mean in terms of our estimates for degree days? So I just summed the degree days across the season uh, or across the six week period. And I actually did it for wheat uh, because it's one I know well. Um, and what we found was the regional weather station would have estimated about 545 uh, degree days while the infield weather station um, it is about 60 degrees, degree days less at 486. So we would have actually overestimated the, the development of, of our wheat in this field. Now that's not all we can do. Uh, I love and have used a lot the infield system, but often the question comes to me, hey, aren't all temperature measurements uh, that we make equal? Uh, what, what's the difference? Why, why should I buy, for example, an Atmos 41 and make a measurement there versus just this nice little passive shield? Well, they're not all created equal. And so again, we're looking at temperature, we're looking over the same time period. So instead, so we have the Atmos 41 I showed in the last slide compared to regional. Now we're comparing the same thing against a passive shield. So the Atmos 41 actually corrects the air temperature based on its radiation energy balance and, and, and the wind speed. Um, the passive shield just hides the, the temperature sensor below a plastic, a white plastic plate or louvered plates. And again, we see the systematic overestimate by the passive shield uh, in blue compared to the orange. Now you might ask me, hey, wait a second, how do you know it's an overestimate? So we've done, we've made uh, many, many comparisons of the Atmos 41 to a aspirated temperature sensor. And we know, and we have data to show that that this is true, that, that the passive shield typically overestimates by about two plus degrees Celsius, while the, the Atmos 41 is generally at about half a degree uh, error or less. So we can see, and I didn't calculate the degree day error, they're closer. As you can see from that, that, that uh, slide here, or the graph here, they are closer, they're just not the same. There's a systematic overestimate uh, by the, the kind of lower cost, non-aspirated temperature system. So what's the take home from all of this discussion? Well, here it is. Plants and insects move through their phenological stages according to thermal time. And I have this beautiful picture drawn on the right-hand side of my coddling moth example going from eggs on the bottom right. Here, uh, those eggs produce pupae that dig into the apple, they eat the apple seed, they come out as, as larvae, they, over, they, they go down and can overwinter on the bark, or they, they actually do a second, second um, uh, life cycle uh, during the summer, so they can be during the summer on the bark, and then they emerge to the as the adults and then they go back on the fruit, lay their eggs on the leaves and, and, and we get this, this life, life cycle going. So if we can understand that cycle that we have there, we can apply um, management practices to make sure we don't waste um, both costly and environmentally challenging um, operations on, on these, these coddling moth, for example. Um, and, and we can also get the apples, for example, that we want. So critical timely action can only be taken on crops and pests using accurate degree days. And, and degree days that we get from virtual and regional weather information can be off, as I mentioned, by multiple days, making any action we do potentially wasted. Local temperature data can provide good degree, esti de good de degree day estimates but the best accuracy comes for aspirated or corrected air temperature. And that's all I have for you today. All right, thanks Colin. That's gonna wrap it up for us today. Thanks again for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this discussion. And for more information on what you've seen today, please visit us at metergroup.com and stay tuned for future meter webinars. Thanks again, stay safe and have a great day.